Travis walked down the street, making sure to keep his head down and not make eye contact with anybody. His mother's words rang in his ears. Don't make eye contact with anybody. Don't walk down alleys alone. And if you see a car driving slowly, run into a store. She said these words every time Travis left the house. Even though nothing had ever happened, he knew his mother was scared of losing her oldest son. The South Bronx is a place where crime had its clutches on the community and, fight, and was fighting not to let go. Some of the smallest things, such as looking at the wrong person funny, could end up getting you killed. Travis knew that turning to a gang on the streets for protection wasn't the way to stay safe. His focus was basketball and taking care of his little brother and mother. That's it. Gangs were heavily present in the Bronx, and because of the, of the appeal to the young, misguided youth for protection and brotherhood, Travis knew that sticking to himself and keeping a small amount of friends would be the best, best way to stay safe. So Travis, so Travis proceeded to make the least eye contact with anybody and go along the, the, along the dirty, hard streets of the South Bronx. Travis kept his head down, and from all these years, he knew which way to go without the slightest glance. The pavement was hard and filled with cracks and gum that had been fried in the summer and frozen in the winters. As Travis continued to walk, he listened rather than looked. He heard all kinds of things, all melting into one voice that he called home. He heard police sirens, subways busting underground, mothers calling their children inside in all different languages, and vendors shouting out prices for food or fake jewelry and knockoff bags. The South Bronx is a melting pot of all different types of languages, cultures, and foods. From Chinese to Dominican and Caribbean to African, the Bronx may not be rich in money, but it was certainly rich in culture. Travis loves his city. Travis walked down 161st Street, heading towards the basketball courts by Yankee Stadium. His friends were going to meet him at 2.30. It was 1 o'clock now, so Travis decided to take a walk to Jerome Avenue, where his friend Montrell lived. He got to his door and banged on the gate to let him in. 16-year-old Montrell James answered the door. Travis sat down on the couch. Montrell went back to the table and began cleaning something he had on a white cloth. Travis asked, what you got there? Montrell replied, nothing, just a little something something to handle my business around the corner. Montrell had picked up a Glock 19 and waved it wearily in the air. He pulled the trigger. Travis heard the click. Travis said nervously, oh man, I forgot. I gotta meet my friends at the park now. Okay, Montrell said, I'll catch you later. Travis shuffled out, Travis shuffled out the door. Why would Montrell have a gun? And why would he be cleaning one? He knew something was bound to happen in a couple days. Travis met his friends at the court. A bunch of gang members were on the court, so Travis and his friends waited their turn until they got off the court. They played for about 45 minutes and the group parted ways. Travis was the only one who stayed working on his game. He was 15 and wanted to make his varsity team at South Bronx High School. Travis was working so hard he didn't notice how dark it was getting. After Travis made his last shot and the clang of the net made him snap back into real life, he looked around. No sounds of children running. No smell of food in the air. Only young men hanging on street corners. Travis picked up his bag and began to hustle down the sidewalk. He decided to take a shortcut and go down Montrell's block. As soon as he turned the corner, he saw Montrell standing on the sidewalk with a few guys in black hoodies holding their belt. Travis knew what was going on. They were waiting for someone. Travis called out to Montrell, but before he knew it, a group of kids came, of a, came out of a house and shots rang out. Montrell took out his Glock and fired repeatedly at the other kids. The guys he was with took out more pistols and continued to shoot. Other kids fired back, and one by one, they began to fall. Montrell and one of the kid he was with were left. They surveyed the damage, windows broken, bodies on the street. They dropped their guns and ran down the street. Travis had noticed that one bullet had nicked him on the leg and blood was slowly dripping down his leg on his all-white Jordans. Travis fell to the ground. He woke up in the hospital with a bandage on his leg. His mother stood above him with tears in her eyes. Mom, I'm sorry. I lost track of time, Travis explained. His mother's thick Jamaican accent cut him off. What did I tell you about staying late, out, staying late at night out on the street, she scolded. Travis had nothing to say, so he asked his mother why Montrell had shot the other guys. His mother responded, Montrell had been robbed on the street and was looking for revenge. The other guys knew he would be looking to kill them, so they used him at, so they were used as a distraction. When Montrell killed them, they knew he would run, so they had a man set up, set up around the corner, and they killed him on the spot. This is why I tell you don't stay out at night. That could have been you, Travis. How do you know those guys didn't know you weren't with Montrell? She finished. Travis had nothing to say. The words... This, the words his mother told him every time he left the house became a part of him. This is why Travis loved his city so much. Anything could happen. This is in the South Bronx. So the moral of the story is, listen to your mom, guys.